Access to clean water and sanitation is a human right, according to the United Nations. Empty words for the people living in the slums of Dar es Salaam. They have neither. It's a vicious circle of poverty and disease. Escaping poverty, having a better life, both of these things are related to whether there is regulated sewage disposal. Around a thousand children under the age of five die every day because of polluted water. Dar es Salaam, Tanzania's booming economic heart on the Indian Ocean. It has an estimated population of four and a half million. Nobody is really certain. More and more people are moving here from rural locations all the time. Rich and poor live cheek by jowl. These conditions hold people back. Yuta Kamago fights every day for better living conditions for the poor. It's a race against time. Everything takes a huge amount of time. Be it a residency permit, spare parts, records with the city council. Nothing goes in a straight line. Everything is convoluted and you have to deal with lots of different people who all have to be included to get just a small step forward. And that's exhausting. Jutta Camargo works for Border, an aid organization from Bremen, Germany, which has an office in Dar es Salaam. Since 2010, development aid projects in several states have been overseen from here, funded by international donors such as the World Bank, the United Nations and the German government. The team want to improve the disastrous water and sanitation situation in Africa. The key word in their philosophy is decentralized. Instead of big high-tech projects, they want simple solutions. Their idea is to have sewage from toilets run through an underground biogas reactor, where the water is cleaned as it runs through multiple chambers and a plant filter. The large facilities we're familiar with in Europe and the United States aren't feasible in Africa. They're too expensive and too complicated. But if you think about alternative solutions while still providing good, humane access to water and sewage services, then I think it will be doable. Everyone has to be included and be given a voice. What's the goal? It's not just about the construction and the investment. You have to think about the subsequent operation. These people are poor. What operating costs are they able to pay for? Jutta Camargo studied water management and has worked for the UN. That experience helps her in her current job. But Dar es Salaam presents her and her team with wholly new challenges. This one, I think, is correct. Green and orange are the densely populated areas, often slums without infrastructure. Only a small section of the city has a sewage system. The districts in yellow have regular typhoid and cholera outbreaks. 70% of the city is unplanned, slums. More than 3 million inhabitants live like this. The only discernible structure is the chaos. It's a labyrinth of alleys and corners where you immediately lose your bearings. Huts that can only very euphemistically be called houses and rubbish everywhere. Everyone channels their wastewater down here untreated and throws their rubbish away with it. 
Anyone growing up here has got used to the stench of excrement. Open ditches replace a working sewage system. Cholera and typhoid are the norm. Eczema and diarrhea are the everyday consequences of inadequate hygiene. Children, in particular, suffer under these conditions. According to the World Health Organization, around 2.4 billion people don't have access to sanitation. Half the population of Tanzania live like this. Around 24,000 Tanzanians die every year from waterborne diseases. 16,500 of them are children. For years, the state didn't feel responsible for the slums. It created virtually no infrastructure, thereby fueling the existing poverty. The informal settlements, as slums are called in politically correct terms, continue to grow every day in an uncontrolled fashion. And every day, more people leave rural areas to move to the city. One central water source for dozens of families. None of the huts here have their own access to water. On good days, Ali Kuawa earns around one euro. Hired by the city council, she sells drinking water to her neighbors for around 10 cents a bucket. In return, Ellie gets her own water for free, but she has to carry every bucket more than 100 meters to her hut. Getting the water every day by the bucket load is a challenge for me. It's exhausting. I have to plan the cooking and washing exactly. Everything to do with water takes place in public. Ali's eldest daughter is washing the youngest, sparingly because every drop has to be carried here. Only the latrine offers privacy. Ali and her children share it with three other families. For the older ones, it's also the bathroom. The latrine is, generally speaking, emptied by rain. During the rainy season, everyone floods their latrines to empty them, but that means my neighbor's excrement runs past my house and the children have to go through that. We're often sick. My children keep getting typhoid, cholera and skin problems. A widow, she lives with nine children in one room, 12 square meters of existential poverty. Everything she has. Whenever she or one of her children gets sick, the calamity worsens. It's a vicious circle. There are lots of poor people who live here and who have to buy expensive drugs when they get sick because they get diseases such as cholera and typhoid. It also has an impact when people can't work, when children can't go to school. Then they don't get an education and that impacts their ability to escape poverty and have a good life later on. All that's connected to the lack of proper sewage facilities. As a result, the state loses around 200 million in economic output every year, and the people pay with their health and their dignity. When asked who has to share their latrine with another family, around half say yes. Only two in 24 have a toilet of their own. The only place in Dar es Salaam where latrines are emptied legally is where trucks can go. Thousands of litres per lorry. 
Untreated, the sewage flows into plants that are basically just huge pools. The attempts to treat the sewage look desperate. The streets and alleyways in the slums are too narrow for trucks. This is where Matias Milinga works. Sludge Go is a border initiative. In return for a fee, Milinga and his colleagues remove sewage from around 14,000 households. Soap mitigates the pungent stench. The largest obstacles are removed. In the past, all the residents waited for the rainy season to flood their latrines. They emptied them illegally. Today, those who can afford the fee wait for Milinga. Milinga's tractor is a real alternative. Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft, agrees. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation supports the project with a million dollars to spread the idea around the world. The Sludge Go program is so successful that Borda is also applying the principle in India and Asia. The sewage flows into a small treatment plant where it's biologically cleaned, generating biogas in the process. It's a model for slums all around the world, and it's good business for Matthias Milinga. Mr. Malinga likes to say that when he set up this shop and friends and relatives and people from the community asked him what his business was and he said that he emptied latrines, then people would look at him like he was crazy. Why would he do that? How could he possibly spend his time like that? Thanks to his work, Malinga can send his children to school. A shrewd businessman, he has achieved modest wealth. He can offer his family a life without deprivation and his children a future. The border project has given him a way out of the slums. I'm like an engineer or a doctor who helps people lead better lives. At first, many made fun of me. Now, nobody's laughing anymore. My family and I have a good life. My children are getting an education. There are now people who want to do the same thing as me. Water is also a central issue for the students at Keiko Mwanga Primary School in Dar es Salaam. Fit for School is a project run by GIZ, a German organization for international collaboration, and UNICEF. On the curriculum, hygiene, an important tool in preventing cholera and typhoid. The message is clear. Those who don't wash their hands get sick. Dirty water kills people in Tanzania. The hygiene lesson comes at the start of every day. Children who have hardly any water at home or who don't have it regularly have to learn the proper hand washing technique and the use of soap. The length of the song tells the children how long they should wash their hands for. It's playful, yet absolutely vital. With the onset of puberty, 
Girls in particular leave school if they don't have sanitary facilities because it's too unpleasant for them. Keiko Mwanga Primary School even offers its students sanitary products. It's an effective measure in reducing the number of girls leaving school. Education is a way out of poverty for Tanzania's children. But only those who are not sick can get an education and with it, better prospects for the future. However, without the support of politicians, this future is unachievable. Yuta Kamago has an important meeting with the water authorities. She masks her nerves with a smile. Personal relationships are hugely important in Africa to drive projects ahead. The technical director is an important decision maker. His attitude is as yet unknown, but any worries are unfounded. On sanitation, sanitation for all. In an area where people they don't have water at all, so when you ask them what do you need first, obviously they will tell you drinking water. And now we have done a lot in Dar es Salaam to add the drinking water. But now a challenge comes, where do we send this water after it's being used? How to dispose it? So this is now becoming a challenge. We have been experiencing outbreak of cholera and uh, waterborne diseases in Dar es Salaam. So for sure, once we improve sanitation, we'll um, have a society which is free of cholera and other waterborne diseases. So the manpower there, it can be used efficiently in economic activities. The rapid rate of population growth threatens to evaporate any government efforts into nothing. Obviously, with the promotions and the awareness raising, people are changing. And they see that there is a need to control family sizes. Once they have improvements in service, everybody should enjoy. It makes no sense if you still have a good number, I mean, big number of good, big size of families. The well, problem will still be there. So they're trying to control. So there is a relationship with the improvement of sanitation and the better life and the family sizes. The problem doesn't start with sewage. The supply of drinking water is often difficult. There aren't pipes everywhere. In those places, the water has to be brought to people by truck. How well that works depends on personal contacts, even for the GIZ. Thanks to these personal connections, some problems are now a thing of the past. There used to be these private lorries that got their water from anywhere, like a salty well or small streams with completely uncertain water quality, and they would sell the water for high prices. That was a disaster for the poor because they had no other choice. The lorries now deliver clean water. The delivery service is a business model that can both make money and take the pressure of the authorities. Ernst Döring has worked for the GIZ in Africa for decades. He knows the continent and the people almost better than his German home. Clean water has long been his focal point. It's a luxury for many residents in Dar es Salaam. Around two million people still don't have access to drinking water. In many cases, sewage from leaky latrines polluted the groundwater, or else it was too deep to drill a well. And that's why the people are grateful for the water kiosk, a GIZ project. 10,000 litres, three to four deliveries of water per day, just in this location. As a water deliverer, Frederick Impemba works closely with the authorities. This public-private partnership project gives Ipemba a secure income. And the state water supplier has one less problem to worry about. The GIZ, at the behest of the German government, has supported the water ministry to regulate this public-private partnership so that the water quality and the price are good. The poor now have clean water at an affordable price, which means they can develop and send their children to school instead of spending their time fetching water. Every day, 3,000 households put their buckets under the tap. 
10 buckets of water cost 1 euro. Fresh water is a blessing, but many families can't afford it. In addition, it's the job of women and girls to lug the heavy buckets. It's a daily chore for this 12-year-old. Several hundred meters and during term time. That's a way even clean water can prevent someone from getting an education. Girls are particularly vulnerable as they have to take on household duties from an early age. <laughs> Camargo's work takes energy. Her days are long and the city's problems endless. Basically every stream in Dar es Salaam is abused as a sewer and a landfill. In the rainy season the pollution is swept out to sea. Although this form of waste and sewage disposal is illegal, nobody need fear punishment. Although this district has two city council employees who work for the health authorities, they're responsible for 45,000 people. It's impossible. The Malakula was a landfill too, up until recently. The change only came, as is so often the case in Africa, through foreign aid. Since the construction of a decentralized sewage plant put in place by Border and GIZ, the situation has improved. The sewage from 4,000 households doesn't flow untreated into the stream anymore. And the amount of waste has also decreased. Instead, the sewage ends up in a biogas reactor. The wastewater from the biogas plant flows from there into our anaerobic filter, which contains different chambers where the organic components are broken down by bacteria. We used a filtration material from the steel industry. It's very porous and very well suited to allow the bacteria in the wastewater to settle and to speed up the decomposition of the biological components that are still in the wastewater. Running the plant is easy and is done by local people. For Border, that's an important aspect of guaranteeing success. The cleaning effect from chamber to chamber demonstrates the efficiency of the plant. The treated, nutrient-rich wastewater is used to irrigate a banana plantation. The trees are bearing fruit for the first time, an important success for the project. The operator of the treatment plant was skeptical at first, but now he's convinced. The income from the banana plantations is an additional income for the operator. We want to show the community that you can incorporate wastewater into a cycle and that you can do other useful things with it. Another advantage is that the plant also produces biogas for cooking. The amount covers the daily demand and completely replaces the need for charcoal. The family can save its pennies and the biogas option also makes their daily life easier. The efficiency of the sewage plants is controlled by border in a special small lab. Despite the simplicity of the system, the bacteria in the filtration chambers react sensitively to chemical impurities. By constantly optimizing the processes, the applications are increased. The future brings new technical challenges. The first residential areas for the gradually growing middle class are being built on the outskirts of Dar es Salaam. These areas will also have decentralized sewage treatment plants through border, but 
on a much larger scale. The system can be used in different combinations. The World Bank now wants to support 50 such plants to improve the situation in the city. There won't be latrines here. Instead, hard work will go into laying sewers. It's slow, laborious work. It's clear why retrofitting the huge slums with proper sewers is an impossible task. Living space for small families. There are two children's bedrooms at most. That will remain a dream for Ali Kurwa. She'll be staying in a hut, just as she has done for the past 30 years. Those who are poor live hand to mouth. They can only go shopping when the money's there. There's never the money to buy much. A rusty charcoal grill, that's Ali's entire kitchen. The family has nothing, not even the embers for the fire. Even they come from a neighbor. One hot meal a day, there's usually not more than that, and even that's a luxury. Their own toilet, clean water, those are far off dreams for this family. Even in better sanitary conditions, Ali wouldn't manage to escape her suffering. Poverty is holding her captive. One of the reasons is the large number of children. Five to six children per family is the average in Tanzania. We have such good lives in Europe. It's perfect. When you see things like this, it's not perfect. The majority have nothing. I'm driven by this sense of injustice. A small percentage have relatively good access here, but the majority have been forgotten. And the forgotten ones are growing in number. By 2050, the population of Africa will double. This rapid increase impacts the people's access to water and is decisive for their prosperity, or poverty. The United Nations wanted to halve the number of people without water by 2015. They failed. The waterless are growing in number in the slums of the world. <laughs>